Good morning. morning. Welcome to the Dispensational Bible Church where we study the whole Bible, Bible's own way. And we are excited for another day of grace and grace in which the Lord Jesus Christ has uh, dispensed to us. And we're excited about that. We're looking at some wonderful faces this morning. Those that are viewing on their web, uh, website, if you want to come and visit us, you are more than welcome. We meet around 10 o'clock every Sunday morning, so we'll hope to see you then. We're going to be singing number 29, Standing on the Promises, and we're going to sing 1, 3, and 5 today. 1, 3, and 5. Mm-hmm. So out sing me, okay? Standing on the promises of Christ the King Through the eternal ages let his praises ring Glory to in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Number three, standing on the promise that I can see. Romans through Philema, it was written just for me. Standing fast in liberty where Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Number five. Standing on the promises, I shall not fall. Following the p- pattern of Apostle Paul. Resting in the Savior who accomplished all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God. my Savior. Standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. All right. Genesis chapter 9. As you notice, we're in uh, lesson 45, so uh, we've been here for a good year or so in Genesis already, uh, close to it. But uh, we're in lesson 45, if you, if you haven't gone to our website or our YouTube channel, you can go back and listen to some of them. But we left off in Genesis chapter 9, verse 28. Now, we talked about Cain and the curse of Cain a little bit last week, and we uh, uh, understood that 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 was a curse that he cursed Ham's son with. And uh, Genesis chapter 9, Verse 28, and Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah was 950 years, and he what? Died. So Noah passes off the scene right here. And Noah lived 350 years after the flood, and he died at the age of 950. Can you imagine being that old today? <laughs> I wouldn't want to be. I wouldn't, yeah, true. I wouldn't want to be. 950 years ago. But anyway, he passes off the scene. Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. Now these are the generations of the son of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and to them were sons born after the flood. Now you will get to the genealogy of Shem, Ham, and Japheth here, and uh, what you have in Genesis chapter 10 is a record of the world population expansion. And, and where did they go? What, who, who are they? And that kind of thing. Verse 2, and the sons of Japheth. Now, you know I can't hardly pronounce these words, so you can read along with me and 
you know, if you want to speak louder when I goof up on them, that, that's, you know. <laughs> no, it's not Gomer. It's Gomer, Magog, Medea, and Jarvan, and Tubla, and Misha, and Tyrus. And verse 3, and the sons of Gomer, and the sons of Javan. But uh, verse 5, but these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their land, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their what? Nations. Now, this would be the first time you ever see the word nations come up here. Now, God deals with, when he, when, when we was talking earlier, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, over, uh, uh, verse 2 all the way over to Acts chapter 9 the focus is on the earth and who was his primary vehicle to do God's will in this earth Israel now are they a nations they're a nation God dealt with Israel as a nation there was no other nation in the whole world that that they didn't know who God was through Israel but Gentiles means nations okay and this is right here, starting the nations. And, his, and, and his, the sons of Ham, Cush, uh, was at Mezram, and Foot, and Canaan. Verse 21 down there. Until Sham, also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. And the children of Sham, verse 22, Elam, Asherah, uh, Argapax, Lud, and Aram. Verse 32, these were the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth. Now, back there in 21, the father of all the children of who? Eber is his great-grandson. And we looked, when we looked at Canaan, when, when Noah said, Ham is the father of Canaan. There's an issue there that has to look at the fact that he's the father of these, of these people. So Sham is the father of the religious group. We broke that down uh, last week. Now, you can go look. The other night, I sat down and pulled up every... I've got a Bible illustrating dictionary that has everybody's names in it, and I'm pulling up every one of those names and where they said on all that. You could, you could spend some time on that, and if, you, you know, if you're amazed with these names and who these people are, that would be a good thing to sit down and say, ooh, they settled there, they settled there, they settled there. When we think about the um, Persians, and we think about the Arabs, and we think about the... Uh, Jew, Jewish people is uh, Jewish people. We think about the Gentile people, that type of thing. You need to know where that place is at because when when Canaan, if I don't get ahead of myself, well, I better I'm going to get ahead of myself. So I back up back up a little bit. But the ark rests on what 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 Mount Ariac, right? Okay. And Noah's boys gets out in three different directions, and Japheth goes west towards Europe, and his descendants are. Indo, Indo-Europeans, okay, people. Genesis 10.2 says the son of Japheth was Gomer. A lot of people said that's Germany. And Magog is Russia. And uh, Medea and Jarvan, is, that's Greece. So they did settle up in that area. And uh, you recognize those people, people because of the, pe- uh, of the nationality they are. Genesis 10.6 says the sons of Ham, Cush, that's Ethiopia. Muslim, that's Egypt. Hut is Libya. And Ham's boys goes in the African continent, okay? There's no, it's, but where did Canaan go? He, he didn't go nowhere. He stayed right there in that area. He stays in Palestine. And uh, Canaan didn't go with the rest of his people. So there's a, there's an entity there that we looked at before. Had they all, let me ask you this. The land of Canaan, you heard of that, right, in the Bible. That who's going to settle the land of Canaan? The people that says from the river to the sea? You hear that a lot lately. They're not settling. 
God's people, God's Israelite is going into the land of Canaan. But who's there? The Canaanites. You ever see who his people are? Philistines. And, and, and the, all the ites. I think there's six or seven ites that's in that land. Strongholds. We call that, we call that um, uh, uh, spiritual strongholds. And God told them when they go across that na- uh, land, what are they supposed to do to those people? And you think, that's, how can a God do that? He knew what type of people they were. They're cursed. You know? And, and when they came back across the Canaan, they mingled with Israel. And what did they do? Messed up. They committed not only spiritual fornication with their gods, they committed regular fornication, and they started messing around with other religions. God don't like that. And today, if you don't mind me saying that, you've seen that coexist why can't we just all get along you know God's going to take care of the Islam people the Persians the air you know he takes care of them before he gets over here according to Ezekiel and the Arabs from my understanding you don't write me call me whatever it means mixed people okay the Persians Iran, that area, they don't like this type of group of people. The only thing's holding them together is the religion. Okay? But what do they think about your religion? Oh, pagan. Infidels. So, so Genesis chapter 10, verse 21, and, and the following. Sham's boys goes uh, uh, towards Persia and India. Get Psalms chapter 105. And Acts 17. Psalms 105. And Acts 17. Page 650. You got the right Bible. <laughs> Seventeen. <clears throat> Psalms 105. Everybody there? Psalms 105, starting with verse 23. Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob subjoined in the land of who? Ham. Got it? So where's Ham people at? Egypt. Verse 27. They showed, his, they showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of 106.22. I'll read that if you don't want to turn there. It says uh, Psalms 106.22. It's just one chapter over. Wondrous works in the land of Ham and terrible things by the Red Sea. So that's where Ham's at. Egypt is a land of Ham. There's no doubt about it if you believe your Bible. Okay? Go to Acts 17. Acts 17. <coughs> In Acts 17, we're going to verse 26, but I want to share something with you. Acts 17, verses 1 through 9, this is where the Thessalonian church gets established. Okay? In uh, verse 10 area, from 10 to uh, 17, chapter 17, verses 10 through 12, the Berean church is established. So if you really want to know the book of Acts, and we'll, go, we'll probably do Acts after we do Genesis, the Lord tarries, you'll, you'll see some things about Acts is the fact that um, it's a transitional book. You don't base your belief, you don't base your doctrine off in the book of Acts because it's ever-changing. But you can find out some things in the book of Acts that you may not ever notice that when these churches was established. And it can, it can, it can really enlighten yourself up in the fact that, uh, you know how people say, Paul's a baptizer. Paul baptized, Paul baptized. And he says, he says in Corinthians, he says, I'll baptize none of you except who? Crispus and Gaius and the household of Stephanus. And he goes, um, anybody else? I don't know. So when was Corinthians written? 
See? So he's saying that, but in, but in Acts, 7, uh, Acts 19, the Ephesians church is established, and this is where he goes to Ephesus and finds certain disciples that knew no, nobody but John's baptism. And Paul looks at him and says, what do you know about the Holy Spirit? Well, we don't know nothing about no Holy Spirit. And he tells them, he says, John said, indeed, believe the one that comes after me. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They was baptized into Jesus, I should say. So you don't, you don't get all that information until you see this. And like, okay, that's Acts 19. The Corinthian church didn't get established over here until 20, Acts 20. And you see, he says, I baptize none of you except these two. But people try to make him out to be a what? Baptizer. That's not the message, but at least you know when you look at Acts, you can see some things. Now, Acts 17, verse 26. Paul is preaching on Mars Hill. First man on Mars, right here. <laughs> you know, there's a little town over here in Pennsylvania called, uh, called Mars. I'm going to deliver to it. And a train depot says, well, you know, Mars. So the first time I saw it, I took a picture of it and said, look, I'm on my Mars, you know, <laughs> and that type of thing. But look, uh, Acts 17, 26. And God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the, all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their inhabitation. inhabitation. What's God doing here? Who has one blood? Who got off the ark? This is what we, I want you to think about. Noah's blood is the blood of all nations. Mo, Mo, Noah had sinless blood, didn't he? No. You can see that when he got off the ark and, and, you know, had a winery. He had a distillery there. He got drunk and all that stuff. But the thing is, what did his kids do? You know what? I mean? So, but they were one blood. This is what you got to look at. And he set bounds. You know what a bounds is? It's boundaries. It's a border. Borders are good, guys. They really are. And I think many of you are finding that out today, that how bad they can be. But God said, why did he do this? Look, verse 27. That they shall... That they should seek the Lord, if happily they meet, might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So you take the blood out of Jacob descendants and put them in Ham descendants. You can take the blood out of the Ham's descendants and put them in Jacob or Sam's descendants. You can take the blood out of Sham's descendants and put them in Japheth's descendants. All three of them. It all fits. It all fits because there are how many blood there? One blood. And they all came from the father Noah, and they're all kin of the same source. That's why when we study, we're studying the book of Genesis, and the first 11 chapters has to still do with us today. There's a lot of interdispensational truths in your Bible you know, even though we're dispensationalists and we say, hey, you got to rightly divide the word of truth, you can find interdispensational truth through the Bible. And we shouldn't be afraid to say that either. Well, I just said it for the world to say. But it, anyway, Acts 17, verse 26. And God had made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the, all the face of the earth and hath determined the times of, before appointed the bounds of his inhabitation. In other words, God divided these people into national entities with geographic boundaries between them. God did that. Now, if God does that, how easy is this to say, uh, in the beginning God created the heaven and what? God made a distinction right then and there. God made a distinction between circumcision and uncircumcision. God made a distinction between Jew and Gentile. He made that distinction, and we should look at that and say, okay, thank you, God. Now we can understand he made a division. So rightly dividing the word of truth, that's truth against truth. It ain't truth against error. You can find that anywhere. It's truth against truth. 
And I was sharing with uh, a guy yesterday as we was on top of my roof. <laughs> and we, what about a great place to share something on top of a roof? Because if they disagree, what? One of you coming off now, just joking. But the thing is, it, about the fact that he made a distinction. God made that distinction. So he's making the distinction with boundaries. And verse 5, 10, uh, Genesis 10, 5 says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their what? Paul's sharing this with these people on Mars Hills, these Athenians that knew everything that was coming and going, right? They're, they worship rocks. He just dealt with the, he just dealt in Acts 17, he just dealt with the uh, Brians. Then he deals with the Thessalonians, who was more noble than those in, no, the Brians were more noble than those in Thessalonica, okay? He's dealing with these people on the basis of the word of God. So well, that should tell us something. How should we deal up with people? Use the words, guys. You, we have the word. And, and, and I tell people all the time, we have to have authority. We have authority. We have a boss over us. Then, you know, that type of But when it comes to words, people read books about the books about the books about the Bible, but they won't read the Bible. They won't study the Bible. You know what I mean? Just look at it. It loves you. But look, uh, they are divided into the lands, territories, into large language groups. So you should know something here. So he divides them into national entities in their lands by their tongues and their nations. That's what God did. He has appointed the bounds of their inhabitation. In other words, he set up boundaries. He sets up institution of what's the fourth institution that God ordained? Remember what the first one was? Free will. God gives you free will. He, he'll never take that away from you. Adam had free will. He made a choice, didn't he? Then the next institution is a marriage between a man and a woman. Then the third institution is a family. Without a family, you don't have stability that helps that marriage. Then we found out in uh, chapter 4, 5, and 6 of Genesis what was going on there? Ungodly stuff. There was no law. There was no government to protect that. So Enoch walked with God and was taken out there. Enoch preached a message about what's coming when Methuselah die, comes, a flood. Okay? Noah preached a message, said, hey, wrath's coming, guys. So they had the word going out, but, but what, who protected that? Who's going to protect you today with this message and where you meet today if you don't have a nationality, a boundary, that so you can what? Let's move on a little bit. So, so why did he do that? This is what I'm, the question I'm asking you with what I just shared with you. Why did he do it? Why did he gather them together in national entities with national government, with national configuration? Why did he do that? Safety is a good reason, wasn't it? You remember before before that happened, what came out? You know what you know what capital punishment is, an eye for an eye. You know what that does to people that wants to kill you. It should make them very very nervous. But ca uh, corporate punishment is like, don't do that. You know, I'll spank you. I think God spanked Israel all through here. Don't you're my child now. I'm, this is what you want to do. Yes, Daddy. And they do it for a little bit, and we, they turn and do something else. And he goes, stop that. Stop that. Today, the Holy Spirit inside of you convicts you. But if you don't have the right doctrine in you, you'd be back over here waiting for God to send you a sign. If you didn't have a sign coming down this morning, you wouldn't know where to turn. You know, I'm not talking about that type of sign. You know, the Israel, hey, you know the first, first two uh, signs? That Israel ever had? Moses goes this way, turns off this. Come back this way, it's like the baby hand. He lays down a staff, it turns into what? Serpent. Comes back up, and they're like, oh. so if they didn't see signs all through what they was doing, they didn't think God was with them. 
Bible says Jews re requires a sign. The Greek seeks after what? Wisdom. But here, why did he do that? Why? You're still in Acts, right? Okay. I know you're I refresh, But look at back Acts 17 for a second. Always hold your finger in Genesis because we're going to be there probably until the Lord comes. <laughs> well, hang on a minute. Acts 17, verse 27 is the reason. Why did he set boundaries? Why did he set national entities? That they shall seek the Lord. Without boundaries, without the protection that you're saying, without the safety, you wouldn't seek the Lord. You would be seeking other things like they did before the flood came. The ungodliness was going on out there. You think... You don't have to go far, far to find ungodliness, guys. You all know that. Many of us got one-eyed monsters in our, in our houses, and there's ungodliness comes to there all the time, your radio and stuff. But this is to protect them. If happily that, that they might feel after him, he's there. He set a boundary around them. He's protecting them. Uh, and find him though he be not far from any, every one of us. That's God. And when you've got a national entity and you've got a national division, every country should be protecting their own people. And with doing so, that gives you a right to stand up and say, I'm secure. I can, you know, the sad thing is you can worship any way you want to worship. And you know we don't, we're by, we're, we're Bible believers, guys. We're not Bible packers. We're not Bible thumpers. You ever talk to people and say, oh, you're just thumping me, thumping me, thumping me. You know, I know you like to hit them, hit them, hit them. But you know, the thing is, you, you share it to them. And sometimes you just got to back off. I know 30 years ago, yeah, 30 years ago, we was introduced to dispensational truths. And we had a teacher that just, I mean, he loved us enough to stay with us, okay, and teach us. But he was like, you got to back up and back all this Pauline stuff on them because you might not have a chance to sit down with them. And when you're talking with people about this truth, if you really want to learn, it's exciting. It's like, wow, the Bible's open up. But some people, you got to watch them because they go, they go, when you still start doing this, it's time to say, I know you're tired, but it's time to go. You know, you've been with them four and a half hours. But, yeah, I'm just joking. But you just got to do it the way God does it. And God Almighty established the principle of nationalism for the protection of the first three divine institutions and, and that which they function, and that is the result. And that, and that they should seek the Lord in Acts 17, 27. That's still true today. Our apostles said that. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's people on every continent and on every place in the world today. There's no new territory. But you share this gospel with somebody and think, where do you find that at? What Bible are you using? It ain't Ed's version. You know, it's right so do you do you know if they if you break down nationalism, you hinder people from finding the Lord? Because what happens? I remember I remember uh, not to get too ugly with what I'm about to say. I remember uh, a president once said, "We are no we're no we're no longer a melting pot, but a bilingual nation." So what did that just do? Makes everything up. And the time's been tough in the United States. Y'all know that. It's been tough. But you have to have a government protect you. You hinder the operation of God's process when you don't. And I think what's going on in this world today, Lord, come quickly. Many of you, I, so just come quickly. Because you know where you're going to be if you're saved, right? You're going to be with the Lord. And you think what's going on today, and you think what's, you know, just something always constantly keeping you upset or keeping your mind off of what you're supposed to be so so what do you think you will find satan doing 
If God is promoting nationalism, the protection abounding, you think Satan's promoting nationalism? You know what he's promoting? (laughs) Internationalism. And you watch some of these international world leaders and stuff like that. They're over in these big places and eating the fine food, but they want you to eat bugs. I don't know if you're catching all that or not. That's internationalism. That's not good. It's like before the corruption of the stars, astro- you correct me if I'm, you got astrology and you got astrology, if I pronounce it right. One's evil, one's good. So if you think that zodiac, if you're looking at that zodiac today, the corruptness, Aries through, what's the last one, whatever it is, and you're looking, that's satanic. That's astrology. Astronomy is God's, what God did. You know, he, 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 he spoke through the stars before his written word. But you can't look at them. You can still look up there and see the wonder. You know, wow. You know, all this stuff. I, I'm on Facebook, believe it or not. But, I, but, but you, you, many of us that live in Ohio, they have a history of Ohio, and they talk about those mounds a lot. The Indian, what they call Indian mounds, serpent mounds, and all that. There's hundreds of them. And they're 30, 40 feet tall. You might have that farmland over, and you like, there's a big old mound. Like, I never pay no attention to it because there's a you know, tree on it, or my cows go up there, and my goats, you know, what, what the case may be. That could be a burial ground. But if you look what they do and what, what they worship, it's satanic. But anyway, God didn't make that to be that way. But internationalism, that's Genesis 11 when we get to it. Okay? And they're trying to destroy the division that God has made among mankind as he expands out. God told Ham, or Japheth, Ham, Shem, Japheth, Shem, Ham, what did he say? multiply, replenish. And that's what they was doing, I believe. And God sends them out there, not just one group, but he puts them out there in national entities and he divides their lands and after their tongues and after their family and their nations to go out and establish a national system and function that well, has the capacity to seek God. And when you try to combine them all together, and we'll see that later on, uh, the stability and they, and they have success and they will find God's purpose in nationalism, giving them protection, giving them a freedom and a function to marry, to raise kids, and that nationalism is to protect that. And when we study Nimrod, y'all may know who Nimrod is, chapter 10 down the road here. And then you go to chapter 11, you get issues with the assault on nationalism, which is internationalism, the Tower of Babel, and how it leads to God calling out one nation from that. Now, you're in chapter 10, right? Genesis chapter 10. Where's the Tower of Babel start? Okay. Do you know how many years per se... From it is when they got off the ark to the Tower of Babel. Well, if you got a Schofield reference Bible, which, you know, that's, it shows you BC, it shows you the dates. 150 years pass from the time they get off that ark to the Tower of Babel. And I believe in Genesis chapter 10, a lot of people say, if I'm mistaken here, um, uh, they'll say uh, that's a rec- uh, G- Genesis chapter ten is just a record what's going what had happened after eleven or before ele- or after eleven after eleven, and I'm like and then you get some you read some commentaries and they say well Shem Japheth and Ham have you noticed how he switched up that who's the oldest we just read it a little while ago Japheth is the oldest it was Japheth. Sham and Ham. But when you get to it, point Sham. 
than Japheth, Ham. Ham, Japheth. So God's showing you who he's going to work through. Shem is where you get your religious people from. We looked at that last lesson. And he's going to work through them because that's who you can trace Jesus Christ's lineages to. That type of thing. But, but uh, where was I going? Oh, 150 years. Yeah. You think within 150 years that those three boys with their families could not have done what God told them to do? Do you know within 150 years we can gather all of us up right here and we'd be one tongue, one color, one nation? So by the time Nimrod and them comes along, guess what they do? Instead of going out, they bring them together. I'm going to be your Wally World. I'm going to be your grocery store. I'm going to be your bank. I'm going to be your... Uh, livelihood, I'm going to be your 15-minute city, I'm going to be, you know, all this stuff. That's what they're doing. So you can understand how things function and work and how they ought to do, to do with what God was doing right now. Now, after he gets over, and we, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the thing is, once he, that happened, what did he do? He picks out one, what? Nation. And that nation is going to do what God told him to do. Now, for those that's been with us for a little while, uh, I got a couple questions to uh, see how well you're at. But uh, let's see where we're at. Um, explain the difference between the treatment of Cain and Abel by the Lord. You know how he dealt with Cain and how he dealt with Abel. What's the difference there? Shepherd, Cain was a farmer. He ended up being the one that was the Okay. Okay. So when you think about this, did Adam and Eve you think they passed on everything what God told them to do, sacrifice-wise? You know, they got ca cast out of the garden, right? God showed them what to bring when he clothed them. They got cast out of the garden. Here's the cherubims with the mercy seat. You think they knew what to bring, sacrifice? So there was not no issue about not knowing. So as you say, Abel, Abel brought a blood sacrifice that pleased God. And Cain, offering... Because he came in his own way. And we studied that out. You can go back and look at that. The way of Cain. The way of Cain is much like the people doing today. And that's before the flood. This is after, you know, now you're talking after the flood. But that's what that is. Um, how does uh, Genesis 4, and I, I'm just going to give you a couple of these because we're going to close. Genesis 4, 19 through 26, trace the development of, of civilization. Genesis 4, 19 to 26 traces the development of civilization. And this is big because what did I share earlier? Genesis 4, 5, and 6. Did they have a government protecting them? Did they have a law? Did they have, a, a, what do you call it, capitalism? No, they did not. As the first civilization develops, it is Canaanites in character, not the Canaanite Cain, you know, one of the boys, in character in rebellion against God. God said, you're going to be a vagabond. You're going to be a wanderer. What did he do? He went to the land of Nod, found a wife, and built a what? city and named it after his son, right? Is that what God told him he was going to do? No. Lemic takes two wives. Introducing, what do you, what do you call? Polygamy. Polygamy. And corruption of the institution of marriage right there. And you see evil grow and spread. And then human good progresses with advancement of animal husbandry, 
the arts of entertainment, the industrial of manufacturing with metals, and organizing organizing cities. Unless you know who Cain was, you mentioned who he was earlier. He was a farmer. His daddy was a farmer. His daddy taught him how to farm. So when God marked him, he says, you're going to be a vagabond. You ain't going to have no land to till no more. The ground ain't going to, it's, it's cursed. So what did he do? We just read it. He built a city. He took his kids and said, okay, this is what you do with brass. Dig it out of the ground, make brass. And he told his kids, this is what you do. He could not farm. But he built an institution, agriculture, and he taught people how to farm. That's pretty smart in a way, but he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Uh, Let's see. Let me give you one more. What is the difference between Noah finding grace in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6, 8, and what Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and Titus 2, 11? What is the difference between that? Noah finding grace in the eyes of the Lord and Paul teaching grace, Noah preaching grace. Well, we talked about that earlier. There's acts of grace, and there's the dispensation of grace. And the grace Noah found was the, was the protection of his family from the corruption around him. And he walked with God as a man of what? Faith. Verse 9, 10, 9 and 10. Noah was warned of God, and he moved with fear. And by obeying God's commandments to build and enter an ark with his animals. That's how he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He did what God told him. And as we looked at that before, Enoch, what he preached and wasn't fearful. And Noah, for 100, how about 120 years building that ark? 120 years, people walking around there laughing, scoffing at him. Ah, you, you, you better get right. It's coming. You know what I mean? We can preach the word of God, right and divided, that Christ, here's the gospel of Christ. Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. You believe that, trust that, Christ, God puts you into Christ. He circumcised you. He baptized you. It's all about him. And you're in Christ. And what should move us in this dispensation of grace is this doctrine. And you build it up inside of you. And you can understand what's going on out there. What Paul speaks of the, his grace as the chief operating principle in this dispensation. There's no works involved. Okay? And if you think faith is a work, you're in error. And a lot of people say, oh, that's easy believism. You grace people think you can do anything you want to. Do you want to? What does grace teach you according to Titus chapter 11 and 12? That the grace of God has appeared to how many men? Teaching us and to deny ungodliness. You can get, you can get, uh, you can get uh, time passed but now and ages come out of the verses right there. And it is all that God is free to do for us based on what Jesus Christ Finished work at Calvary. Go to Titus chapter 2 and we're going to close right quick. By the way, how big was the ark? Remember? It's 300 cubics. It's 300 cubics long. 
50 cubics wide, 30 cubics high, and we figured a cubic was 18 inches, 18, 24 inches. How was it, sh how was it shaped? Was it was a ship that had sails and rudders? It was a box. It was a coffin, if you will. It was just made to float. It wasn't made to, look what I'm doing, Lord. And it sit there on that water. And uh, where did I say go? Titus? Timothy? Titus chapter 2. <coughs> Verse 11. We just mentioned this. I just want you to see it yourself. <coughs> For the grace of God that appeareth uh, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to how many men? Not many. You don't get to all until you get to Paul. Just remember that. It was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was to the many. It was to the nation Israel. For God so loved the world. That world is that system that God set up that he loved. He wanted to see us prosper. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteousness, and godly in this present world. Looking for that, okay, verse 11, time passed. Hath, done deal. Verse 12, teaching us, that's right now, in this present world. Ages to come. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he, that, that he might redeem us of all iniquity and pure, pure, was it? Pure, purify unto himself a particular people zealous of what? You are a particular people today. Don't people look at you particular? Right? And you know what I'm going to say. I'm special. You're peculiar, okay? But anyway, uh, uh, Israel chapter 19 over here, this right here, uh, Exodus chapter 19, he takes them out to be a, a kingdom of what? Priest. A peculiar people too. So what, both of us peculiar, but that's ages to come. When he takes us out of here. So man, we've got a message today just like Noah had a message. Just like Enoch had a message. Just like John the Baptist. We got a message today to save people and get them out of bondage. And you don't want to be in bondage, people. You don't want to be a slave to anything. Religion is, you know what religion means? Return to bondage. And that's what people does. Oh, you religious? No, I'm not religious. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for things given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.